Generation Fighter Assets, the USS George H.W. Bush Carrier Strike Group, Command and Control Elements, Rescue and Refueling Aircraft during a long-range, large-force exercise that included live fire exercises with more than 140 aircraft and roughly 6,400 U.S. troops alongside more than 1,500 Israeli troops participated in the exercise. This week, the U.S. Marine Corps will reactivate Camp Blas in Guam, part of an agreement with the Japanese government to reposition Marines from Okinawa, as well as contribute to the overall integrity of integrated deterrence and bolster U.S. operational security in the Indo-Pacific region. Camp Blas will serve as a strategic hub and training area for joint forces, allies, and partners in the region. The Marine Corps has a deep history in Guam, and we are committed to continuing that strong relationship. And finally today, the department is releasing our new comprehensive small business strategy. The strategy will guide DOD in its ongoing effort to leverage the exceptional creativity, innovation, and range of capabilities that small businesses bring to our nation's defense industrial base. Expanding small business opportunities is an absolutely vital part of the department's commitment to fostering a robust and resilient industrial base, and the strategy will be released uh, via defense.gov. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. I'll go ahead to Lita. Um, Sabrina, I'm hoping you can sort of fill in some blanks from yesterday on uh, the tank issue, now that we're a day out of the uh, announcement. Um, can you give us some better granularity on the training? How soon will it start? When, maybe, and will it be done? Even if you can't say exactly where, do you expect it will be done? in the continent of the United States, or, I mean, there are obviously some in Europe that could be used. Can you just kind of space that out for us at least a little bit, and will it look sort of like the striker training, you know, a couple hundred, you know, several hundred here or there? Sure. So unfortunately, I, I think you're going to be a little bit disappointed with my answers today. Um, in terms of how soon, I just don't have a timeline for you. Um, we are trying to get the, the training set up, but as of uh, a timeline and when, where that's going to be and when, I just don't have that available at this moment. Um, but I know that's something that uh, is certainly going to be of interest. So when we have more updates, I'll certainly be able to read that out. Great. Yeah, Jen. Sabrina, is there a shortage of M1 Abram tanks? Is that why you're having to go through the procurement process? It's not going to allow them to be there until, you know, almost a year's time. Why not just take them off the shelf to get them in the fight sooner? That's a great question. We are using the USAI because that's exactly it. We just don't have these tanks um, available in excess in our U.S. stocks, which is why um, it is going to take months uh, to transfer these M1 uh, uh, A2 Abrams um, to Ukraine. And I think that you have to remember, I mean, as you probably know, these tanks are going to require training, maintenance, sustainment. That is going to take a very long time to also train the Ukrainians on. Um, and so because of that, and we took that into account, that's why we um, are using the USAI uh, capability in order to um, procure these uh, tanks for the Ukrainians. And what changed from Tuesday to Thursday when here at the podium we heard that the M1 Abram was too difficult logistically to support, it was the wrong uh, weapon to be sent, and then hearing that the president had authorized 31 to be sent? Well, I don't think that... Um, I would just say that, you know, we stand by the statements that we made from here at the podium and that um, you've heard Secretary Austin or, and the chairman say before. These are going to be difficult capabilities to maintain and sustain. Uh, we stand by that. There's going to be challenges to them. Um, that said, uh, following the secretary's visit to the Ukraine contact group, meeting with partners and allies, we saw um, a commitment in um, immediate capabilities that could be rushed to the battlefield right now um, or in the in the near term. And part of our commitment to giving the Abrams is a long-term show of commitment. And so the timing um, made sense, along with our partners and allies announcing other capabilities that they were going to give to Ukraine. And so, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that uh, decisions changed. We've always been very honest about the challenges with these capabilities. Tony. Can you uh, walk a little bit through Tank Build 101? Uh, you mentioned this is the M1A2 Yeah, that's model. what I specialize in. I'd be happy uh, to. That's why I asked. <laughs> so does this, this implies that they're going to upgrade older model M1A1s that are not in the active Army inventory into this A2 configuration. Is that 
accurate. Package. We're working through the details right now. We're trying to procure new tanks mm -hmm. through the USAI, but again, we're working through those details right now, so I don't have any additional updates on that. So new tanks implies building from scratch, taking pieces together, pulling. That's not the way the Army's done it for the last 20 years. Well, it's so check into that. Well, can. it would it would entail working with industry and right. and and contracting those out, and part of that is acquiring new tanks. So that that's. That's where the process, uh, that is our goal in the process. In terms of um, final delivery, again, right. we'll keep you updated on that, but that is the goal of what we announced. New versus, new meaning upgraded model to the older model, the A1 <coughs> models. That's all, when, if you can pull that string and get some clarity yeah. on that, that would be helpful. Okay. And on the training question, can you check also, is there gonna be like, uh, simulation in Europe, you're going to fly simulators over there, or is there going to be like distributed test uh, training from like Fort Benning's armor school where guys can be at computers in, the, in right. Ukraine and do it uh, virtually like that? That would be useful to know. Well, we have many different ways to train on the Abrams. Again, we haven't started that training, right. so I don't want to put the cart before the horse here. Um, you know, when we have more uh, details, I'd be happy to get back to you, and I'm sure I could have made a tank joke there, but I, I didn't. Thanks for the Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a question about Camp Laws uh, yeah. in Guam. And the last I had checked earlier today, the Marines hadn't given a number for the number of Marines that will be going to that new camp. Can you provide that number? And additionally, there was a new unit that's going to be um, located on Okinawa. So is that a backfill? Because my understanding that for decades, the U.S. and Japan have been working to move U.S. forces off of Okinawa to Guam. Mm -hmm. So can you explain the math there? Is yeah. there going to be a reduction of forces on Okinawa, and what are the numbers? No, this was an agreement that was set up in 2012 to establish this base, um, uh, Camp Blas, and there will be 5,000 Marines stationed there. Um, sorry, I should have read that out at the top. Um, no, this doesn't reduce the presence at Okinawa. This is something, the Camp Laws was already an agreement um, that has taken a while to, to get up and running to establish this, um, uh, to establish Camp Blas, but in terms of our commitment to Okinawa, we're still gonna have a presence there as well. So if I could just follow up, yeah. the, the Japanese are paying for part of this move though, correct? And if so, why are they paying if there's not a net reduction in the number of forces on Okinawa? I would have to get back to you on the, the funding aspect there. I just don't have that uh, here right now, so I, I'm happy to take that Does question. Does it benefit them strategically to move Marines away from Japanese well, territory? It, well, I mean, it's about establishing our presence in the region. We're establishing, uh, I think, a wider presence, you could say, there. So it's not about uh, necessarily being uh, far away. I think it in fact, recommits our presence to the region that we are, um, you know, solidly behind Japan. And um, this is just one other place where we will have our Marines based. I'm going to go to the phones. Uh, Jeff Shogel, task and purpose. Uh, thank you. The Marine Corps recently divested its fleet of tanks. Is there some reason the U.S. can't send them to Ukraine? And also, I spoke to an expert who said it doesn't make sense to give the Ukrainians 30 Abrams, 14 Leopards, et cetera. Give them 100 of each, and that will justify having multiple maintenance systems. I wanted to know if you could respond. Thank you. I'm happy to take that. Uh, I'm happy to respond to that question. I'm sorry, but you broke up on your first question. I couldn't hear that. Could you repeat that? The Marine Corps has divested its fleet of M1 Abrams tanks. Couldn't they be sent to Ukraine? So again, a part of this uh, USA pa USAI package that we rolled out is um, trying to procure new tanks for Ukraine. Um, again, I don't have an update of, of um, when those will come. It's going to be not weeks, it's going to be months. Um, so I will keep you updated on that. In terms of your second question on, um, I think it was on why aren't we supplying hundreds of, and then you, you listed a, a Abrams, Leopards, all of that. Again, these are sovereign countries making decisions on security assistance for themselves and what they can give to Ukraine. Um, we are incredibly grateful for what our partners and allies have uh, given so far. Uh, as you saw, we just announced 31 Abrams um, just this week. I think that is, um, it's certainly not a symbolic commitment. It is a commitment that we're in it for the long term. We're in it uh, for what Ukraine might need uh, on the battlefield in the 
in the coming future and then further out in the future. And so um, I certainly think that is um, a commitment that you've not not only seen from us, but you're seeing it from other European um, countries and allies give uh, their additional weapons and uh, capabilities. I'm going to go to Lara Politico. Hey, thanks, Sabrina. Sorry for delay. I needed to unmute myself. Um, just wondering if you could tell us whether we are sending the depleted uranium bullets along with the tanks. I'm going to get into any more details about uh, what we're sending. You've seen uh, the, the release it's posted on defense.gov. That's, that's as, about as far in detail as I will get right now, Laura. Thanks. I'll come back in the room. Jenny. Thank you, uh, Sabrina. Yeah. Uh, upcoming Secretary Austin the visit to South Korea this weekend. Uh, what agenda will the two secretaries discuss? Yeah, well, I think you'll see the secretary certainly highlight our commitment to the region. I don't want to get ahead of the secretary um, and his trip that you just mentioned, as you know, is coming up and uh, heading out on, on Sunday. But again, our commitment to South Korea remains rock solid. Um, and he's looking forward to, to meeting with his counterparts there. Do you have uh, any plan for uh, meeting with the South Korean President Yoon Song yeol I don't have any anything to read out about a, a meeting now, but with more details, uh, when we're ready to release more details on the trip, we'd be certainly happy to get them to you. Sure. What is your view on the weapons deal between Russia's Wagner Group and the North Korea? Yeah. Um, well, we've seen the Wagner Group uh, try and procure and, and be successful at procuring uh, uh, weapons from North Korea. I think that shows further isolation, um, that Russia is uh, depleting its stocks pretty, pretty quickly. And, um, you know, again, when you're turning to a country like North Korea, Iran, um, these are countries that are already isolated from um, an incredible alliance that has been built around support for Ukraine. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Thanks, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. um, this morning, AFRICOM announced that the U.S. military conducted a successful counterterrorism operation in Somalia. I just wanted to see if you can give us any details on that. Was that a drone strike? Um, who did it target? Was an ISIS target? Can you name? Uh, the target. How did it go? Yeah, as you know, AFRICOM put out their statement. It, it was a successful operation, but I just don't have further details to announce at this time. I believe they will be providing some uh, soon. Okay, yeah. Uh, yesterday, when President Biden announced this tank uh, and the, the aid, yeah. tank aid to Ukraine, he said Secretary Austin advised him to do that. He did. And could you tell us? based on, because we heard from this department several times that it's not a rational, like it's not tactically, it's there, it's difficult to maintain, sustain them. Could you tell us what was the rationale behind Secretary Austin's advice? Was it a political or was it a military tactical uh, advice? Well, I think the secretary and the chairman's position when it came to the the Abrams has not changed. I mean, it is going to be a challenge to sustain and maintain these tanks. That said, um, following the contact group, following meetings with partners and allies there, and again, these are almost 50 nations participating in the contact group, um, the secretary came away from those conversations feeling that uh, we needed to provide a long-term commitment to Ukraine. And we, we know that um, it's not just going to be armored personnel carriers. It's not just going to be infantry vehicles, tanks. I mean, these are all capabilities that are that are um, going to enable uh, more maneuverability. But it's not just one system that's going to be the, you know, the magic wand that all of a sudden ends this war. Um, but providing a long-term commitment was something that the secretary felt very strongly about. And that is why he recommended to the president that we do provide these Abrams. And, you know, I've seen people say, well, this is this symbolic of, um, you know, something just given to Ukraine so you could unlock other allies to, to give their tanks. And I would say to that that um, I, I don't think a battalion of Abrams giving to, to Ukraine is at all symbolic. This is a real capability that will— um, certainly give Ukraine um, an upper edge on the battlefield. Yeah. Yep. Ukrainians are asking many other complicated, sophisticated mm -hmm. systems as well. Yeah. But of course. But, but tanks, 
Can you explain to us, elaborate on how these Abrams are going to play into the long-term commitment? What do you mean by that? I really don't get it. Well, the long-term commitment is we don't know when this war is going to end. I mean, it could end tomorrow if Vladimir Putin decided, but it doesn't seem that he is um, uh, going to make that decision. So this this war could go on till the end of the year. It could go on for many years. And so by giving these Abrams through the USAI package, that shows a long-term commitment to Ukraine and, I think, really sends a message um, that our allies and partners are united in our support for Ukraine. And um, we are not going to stand uh, for Russia's, again, illegal invasion of Ukraine. If it's long -term, why not F-16s and but tanks? I'm sorry, I don't understand as, the question. As, as we are talking about the long-term commitment, why we are not discussing F-16s to Ukraine, instead we are saying just tanks. Well, As it's going to be a long-term commitment than Ukraine. But we haven't, we, have other, we haven't announced other packages. Again, we have authorization from Congress uh, to continue to have presidential drawdowns, other security assistance packages. So we are going to continue to provide Ukraine with what it needs in the short term and the long term. I'm going to move on. Yeah. Hello. A couple Hello. of questions. Um, is the M1 models going to Ukraine going to be the same as the M1s that are going to be going to Poland? Because General Dynamics says Poland's getting the M1A2, SEP V3, the top of the line right. M1. I mean, is, is it going to be the same as Poland is getting? I'm just going to say that it's going to be the M1A2. I'm not going to get into further specifics on that. And also, when, can you comment on, on Russian? Uh, the Russian ambassador here said that this is a, you know, it's an escalation. Of, of I mean, I feel like I've heard that said. talking point before from them when it was, whether it was the javelins that we were giving or the high Mars and then the Patriot. Uh, everything seems, uh, I guess, to be an escalation. I don't view it as that. Uh, this is a war that Russia started, uh, invading a sovereign state. And um, I, 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 the only escalation here is the continued barrage of whether it's Russian strikes against uh, an electrical grid or killing innocent Ukrainian civilians. Um, that is that is the escalation that we're seeing. So I, I don't view our support for Ukraine as any escalation at all. Great. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Serena. Um, so we're sending in the tanks. Um, they could be susceptible to air attacks. Does it make sense to send in air defense, like they were mentioning, the F-16s? Is that next? And it seems like we keep pushing the envelope on, on what we're sending as the war evolves. So I was curious, what is the new line for us here? Well, I don't know that we've ever drawn a line. We certainly, you know, we're not going to take anything off the table here. Um, we are given air defense capability systems and, you know, we're training the Ukrainians on the on the Patriots right now. Um, they've we've seen them make incredible use of some of the air capabilities that not just we have given, but other countries and other partners. Um, in, in terms of what's next, you know, again, I'm not going to get ahead of any packages that haven't been announced or any decisions by the president or the secretary. But I think our commitment remains, as you've seen, um, pretty forceful with Ukraine. Like Ukraine, that was the next thing they were asking for just after this decision was made yesterday with the tanks was the F-16. So I was just curious if that was on the table or up for discussion. Yeah, I saw I, nothing to announce today. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the briefing. My question is about the follow-up of procurement of the tanks. Sure. Uh, you just said that you will provide uh, M1A2, the top of the line uh, of the Abrams, to the Kiev. But some reports suggest that because of the secret armor, uh, of the Abrams in the U.S. Army, the United States does not want to send its tanks and decide to order from the manufacturers rather than pulling from the stockpiles uh, to prevent these secrets to be discovered by, by Russians. Uh, uh, can you confirm these reports? I cannot. No, I have nothing to say. Uh, I, I cannot confirm that report. We're giving the M1A2 variant uh, of the of the tank. Um, again, this is something that we're trying to uh, newly procure through the USAI. But I would just I have nothing else to comment on that. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much. I wanted to get back to the Russian allegations about this is an escalatory step by sending the tanks. You said that you've heard that type of language from Russia time and time again. Is it the sense in the Pentagon that Russia's rhetoric is just bluster and that they don't have the capacity now to really strike back or further escalate or draw some sort of red line that would escalate the conflict perhaps to a nuclear level or something else? Um, 
No, I would. I mean, I, you know, we we of course take what Russia says seriously. I think uh, we've just heard that line before that every time we announce a new round of security assistance, they always seem to say, "Well, this is escalatory." Um, again, what is escalatory is them continuing this war each and every day, where you know. Vladimir Putin could make the decision tomorrow to end it. Um, you had a question on, I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm blanking on the second part of it. Is the sense in the Pentagon that there is no red line now that would oh. cause Russia to do something, to, to take the war to a level that would involve NATO or an attack on NATO or the use of, of tactical nukes as they've threatened before? Well, again, we've seen no indication that Russia intends to use a nuclear weapon. Um, you know, in terms of a, a red uh, a line that would be crossed, you know, I, I would leave that to Russia to answer that. Um, all we can continue to do is to continue to support Ukraine with what it needs on the battlefield. And that's why um, you're seeing immediate uh, uh, support going flowing in right away to the country and then also seeing long term commitments. But in terms of, you know, what Russia says, again, we, we, we do take seriously their threats um, against uh, Ukraine, against any of our partners and allies. Um, but, you know, the constant barrage of missiles coming down on the Ukrainian civilians, on electrical grids and infrastructure, again, this war could stop tomorrow, today. Um, and so, you know, I, I, we're going to continue to stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Would it be fair to say, then, that there's less pause here in the U.S. when Russia makes those threats regarding the provision of more advanced weapon systems? I mean, I'm, I, I'm trying to, I, I feel like I've answered that question, but I just want to say that, again, we've heard these comments from Russia before. Uh, we do take what Russia says seriously, if they are going to threaten um, a partner, an ally, us. But we've heard them say before that these actions are escalatory. We are going to continue to provide Ukraine what it needs. And we are in this for the long term. And you've heard the president say that. You've heard the secretary uh, say that. And I think our um, announcement this week just reaffirms that. I'm going to take a few more before we have to head out. Yeah. Um, recently, there was a media report saying that the U.S. decided not to deploy ground-launched and intermediate-range missiles to Japan. So could you give us comment on this? And also, I'm wondering what could be the significance of deploying U.S. medium-range missiles in the, in the Pacific region? And also, I'm wondering if this posture planning could be affected by the recent decision by Japan to have counter-strike capability, including long-range missiles. Okay, so a lot there. Um, so I've seen the reporting, you know, the, the department has no plans to uh, deploy capabilities to Japan uh, with a range beyond 500 kilometers. Um, so the reporting, I would, you know, Dis dispute that. I think this press speculation on the intermediate range uh, missiles that you were just asking about, um, that's inaccurate. We're not going to further comment on internal discussions, but our commitment to Japan uh, remains rock solid. Um, as you saw from the meetings that we had just a few weeks ago with the secretary um, in the 2 plus 2. So, um, again, we are always going to continue to modernize and enhance our uh, security capabilities in the region, but um, I just have nothing more to add on those reports. Great. Yeah, Chris? If I could just follow up on the F-16 sure. issue. Um, you've talked and the department has talked a lot about providing Ukraine with a comprehensive uh, ability, a combined arms ability. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not asking you to get ahead of any specific announcements on specific aircraft, but why does the department, why has the department viewed aircraft, fighter aircraft, as not something that Ukraine needs so far? Well, I don't think that we've said that, but we are providing them capabilities that they need on the battlefield right now. Um, part of that is the armored uh, personnel vehicles, the, the infantry vehicles that we are providing, the tanks. Um, we have not said that they don't need air support. That's why we're providing them air defenses. Um, so I'd, I'd kind of push back on the characterization of that question. Um, but again, I'm just not going to get ahead of any future package that we, that we have to announce. I'm going to go back to the phones here. Uh, Caitlin, New York Post. Hi, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, um, 
I'm just wondering, you know, can you tell us at all, you know, why the German and British tanks are easier to get to the battlefield sooner? You know, is it really only the M1's gas turbine and jet fuel logistics issue that's kind of making it slower and needing more training? And then also to come back to Jeff's question, why can't the divested, the divested Marine Corps tanks be sent? Is there some reason that Ukraine can only receive new tanks? Um, or, I mean, honestly, was the decision to use these funds partly made to delay delivery? No, I would say, I would again, we are using the USAI to show a long-term commitment, but it's not about delay. We just do not have these Abrams available in our stocks to give the Ukrainians at this time. Um, in terms of the the other tanks, you, you know, there are other specifications on um, whether it's the Challengers or the Leos. I'm not going to get into those uh, specifically. I think um, there's information available out there that, you know, you could look into on why one is more mobile than the other. Um, I believe they're also, I, th I think, slightly a, a lighter uh, tanks, so just slightly easier to transport. But again, I, I think just on the notion that, um, you know, there was some type of delay. The USAI does show a long-term commitment here, but again, we did not have these Abrams available in our stocks to give the Ukrainians, and that's why we're looking to procure them and procure new tanks. Um, and when we have uh, more information to update you on, I will, I will certainly do that. I'm going to go to one more uh, question on the phone here. Oscar, Polish news agency. Hi, um, thank you for taking the question. I was wondering, um, can you, so since the tanks will be new, will it, um, will the production impact the ongoing production of, and, and deliveries of M1 A2, A2 to uh, Poland? And um, well, you know, so, so the delivery to Poland is scheduled um, for 2025. So I'm wondering if the um, Ukraine delivery will not take months, but maybe years. Thank you. Thank us, Oscar, for the question. So again, just just to be clear here, our intent is to procure new tanks. Now, if we cannot, or if if there are um, updates to that, I will certainly let you know. But I'm not going to get into the specifications or technical details of what what is in the like. The, the tanks and, and, and more specificity. All I can tell you is that it is the M1A2. Now, I didn't put a timeline on anything, um, so I'm not sure where you're getting 2025 here. I just said that it's going to take um, months. This is a long-term commitment, but I just don't have a timeline for you of when these tanks uh, will be delivered to Ukraine. Okay, I'm gonna come back in the room and then we'll have to head out. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to follow up on uh, if 16. Okay. Uh, so, um, without uh, getting into specific cases, could you please talk about, uh, in general, the possibility and um, obstacles to provide such um, uh, pilot jets? Well, you know, this is a capability that would require training, um, would require more people to come off the battlefield to learn a new, an entirely new system. Um, uh, and again, the Ukrainians have proven that they can they can learn complicated, complex, challenging systems. Um, it is more, in terms of like the Abrams, it is more the sustainment, the maintenance when it's on the battlefield. Um, with the F-16s, again, another challenging system that would re require training. Um, and I'm not going to get ahead of any announcement because I don't have an announcement today. So I'll leave it at that. Yes. Uh, Russia reportedly has a ship with hypersonic missiles on it in the mid-Atlantic. Should Americans be concerned? We've seen reports of that. The Coast Guard, I believe I spoke to this last week, actually, the Coast Guard is monitoring um, the, the Russian ship, but it's operating in international waters. We've seen this before. Um, we haven't seen any unsafe or unprofessional behavior, so I don't think Americans need to be worried about that. Um, but we'll continue to monitor. Louis. Just to clarify, he was asking about in the mid-Atlantic, not in oh, the Pacific. Same, sorry. Same as that. I'm sorry. I was remembering from last week about the, um, the Russian ship off the coast of Hawaii. Again, yeah. Sorry, can you confirm that it has hypersonic missiles on the ship? I cannot. I cannot. I would have to look into that for you. I just don't know. But um, I would, again, we have not seen any unprofessional, unsafe uh, behavior, and so there's no need for concern. Yeah, I'll take one more. Yeah, well, uh, you, about the divested uh, marine tanks, 
I don't know if you, you might not have it, but can you take the question, where are they now? What happened to those tanks? I don't yeah. know where those are. I'm happy to take the question. But again, in terms of our procurement of these Abrams, we are looking to procure, our intent is to procure new tanks. So, they weren't yeah. transferred over to the U.S. Sorry? That's I understood that they were being, they were going to be transferred to the I would have to look, and I just don't, I just don't know off the top of my head right here, so I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, sorry, there's an event in here coming up soon, so we're going to have to wrap up, but happy weekend. Happy early weekend.